She interrupted. Her voice held feeling now. It trembled. Over me? It's what has come over you. Nothing's come over me. Oh. Patrick. It has. You insisted so on coming here. You were quite vehement. I wanted to go to Tindigal again where, where we had our honeymoon. You were bent on coming here. Well, why not? It's a fascinating spot. Perhaps. But you wanted to come here because she was going to be here. She? Who is she? Mrs. Marshall. You, you're infatuated with her. For God's sake, Christine, don't make a fool of yourself. It's not like you to be jealous. His bluster was a little uncertain. He exaggerated it. She said. We've been so happy. Happy? Of course we've been happy. We are happy. But we shan't go on being happy if I can't even speak to another woman without you kicking up a row. It's not like that. Yes, it is. In marriage one has got to have, well, friendships with other people. This suspicious attitude is all wrong. I, I can't speak to a pretty woman without your jumping to the conclusion that I'm in love with her. He stopped. He shrugged his shoulders. Christine Redfern said. You are in love with her. Oh, don't be a fool, Christine. I've, I've barely spoken to her. That's not true. Don't for goodness sake get into the habit of being jealous of every pretty woman we come across. Christine Redfern said. She's not just any pretty woman. She's, she's different. She's a bad lot. Yes, she is. She'll do you harm, Patrick, please, give it up. Let's go away from here. Patrick Redfern stuck out his chin mutinously. He looked, somehow, very young as he said defiantly. Don't be ridiculous, Christine. And, and don't let's quarrel about it. I don't want to quarrel. Then behave like a reasonable human being. Come on, let's go back to the hotel. He got up. There was a pause, then Christine Redfern got up too. She said. Very well. In the recess adjoining, on the seat there, Hercule Poirot sat and shook his head sorrowfully. Some people might have scrupulously removed themselves from earshot of a private conversation. But not Hercule Poirot. He had no scruples of that kind. Besides, as he explained to his friend Hastings at a later date, it was a question of murder. Hastings said, staring. But the murder hadn't happened, then. Hercule Poirot sighed. He said. But already, mon cher, it was very clearly indicated. Then why didn't you stop it? And Hercule Poirot, with a sigh, said as he had said once before in Egypt, that if a person is determined to commit murder it is not easy to prevent them. He does not blame himself for what happened. It was, according to him, inevitable. 3. Rosamund Darnley and Kenneth Marshall sat on the short springy turf of the cliff overlooking Gull Cove. This was on the east side of the island. People came here in the morning sometimes to bathe when they wanted to be peaceful. Rosamund said. It's nice to get away from people. Marshall murmured inaudibly. M, M, yes. He rolled over, sniffing at the short turf. Smells good. Remember the downs at Shipley? Rather. Pretty good, those days. Yes. You've not changed much, Rosamund. Yes, I have. I've changed enormously. You've been very successful and you're rich and all that, but you're the same old Rosamund. Rosamund murmured. I wish I were. What's that? Nothing. It's a pity, isn't it, Kenneth, that we can't keep the nice natures and high ideals that we had when we were young? I don't know that your nature was ever particularly nice, my child. You used to get into the most frightful rages. You half-joked me once when you flew at me in a temper. Rosamund laughed. She said. 
Do you remember the day that we took Toby down to get water rats? They spent some minutes in recalling old adventures. Then there came a pause. Rosamund's fingers played with the clasp of her bag. She said at last. Kenneth? Um. His reply was indistinct. He was still lying on his face on the turf. If I say something to you that is probably outrageously impertinent will you never speak to me again? He rolled over and sat up. I don't think, he said seriously, that I would ever regard anything you said as impertinent. You see, you belong. She nodded in acceptance of all that last phrase meant. She concealed only the pleasure it gave her. Kenneth, why don't you get a divorce from your wife? His face altered. It hardened, the happy expression died out of it. He took a pipe from his pocket and began filling it. Rosamund said. I'm sorry if I've offended you. He said quietly. You haven't offended me. Well then, why don't you? You don't understand, my dear girl. Are you so frightfully fond of her? It's not just a question of that. You see, I married her. I know. But she's pretty notorious. He considered that for a moment, ramming in the tobacco carefully. Is she? I suppose she is. You could divorce her, Ken. My dear girl, you've got no business to say a thing like that. Just because men lose their heads about her a bit isn't to say that she loses hers. Rosamund bit off a rejoinder. Then she said, You could fix it so that she divorced you, if you prefer it that way. I dare say I could. You ought to, Ken. Really, I mean it. There's the child. Linda? Yes, Linda. What's Linda to do with it? Arlena's not good for Linda. She isn't really. Linda, I think, feels things a good deal. Kenneth Marshall applied a match to his pipe. Between puffs he said. Yes, there's something in that. I suppose Arlena and Linda aren't very good for each other. Not the right thing for a girl perhaps. It's a bit worrying. Rosamund said. I like Linda, very much. There's something, fine about her. Kenneth said. She's like her mother. She takes things hard like Ruth did. Rosamund said. Then don't you think, really, that you ought to get rid of Arlena? Fix up a divorce? Yes. People are doing that all the time. Kenneth Marshall said with sudden vehemence. Yes, and that's just what I hate. Hate? She was startled. Yes. Sort of attitude to life there's nowadays. If you take on a thing and don't like it, then you get yourself out of it as quick as possible. Dash it all, there's got to be such a thing as good faith. If you marry a woman and engage yourself to look after her, well it's up to you to do it. It's your show. You've taken it on. I'm sick of quick marriage and easy divorce. Arlena's my wife, that's all there is to it. Rosamund leaned forward. She said in a low voice. So it's like that with you? Till death do us part? Kenneth Marshall nodded his head. He said. That's just it. Rosamund said. I see. Mr. Horace Blatt, returning to Leathercombe Bay down a narrow twisting lane, nearly ran down Mrs. Redfern at a corner. As she flattened herself into the hedge, Mr. Blatt brought his sunbeam to a halt by applying the brakes vigorously. Hello, 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 said Mr. Blatt cheerfully. He was a large man with a red face and a fringe of reddish hair around a shining bald spot. It was Mr. Blatt's apparent ambition to be the life and soul of any place he happened to be in. The Jolly Roger Hotel, in his opinion, given somewhat loudly, needed brightening up. He was puzzled at the way people seemed to melt and disappear when he himself arrived on the scene. Nearly made you into strawberry jam, didn't I, said Mr. Blatt gaily. Christine Redfern said. Yes, you did. Jump in, said Mr. Blatt. Oh, thanks, I think I'll walk. 
Nonsense, said Mr. Blatt. What's a car for? Yielding to necessity Christine Redfern got in. Mr. Blatt restarted the engine which had stopped owing to the suddenness with which he had previously pulled up. Mr. Blatt inquired. And what are you doing walking about all alone? That's all wrong, a nice-looking girl like you. Christine said hurriedly. Oh. I like being alone. Mr. Blatt gave her a terrific did with his elbow, nearly sending the car into the hedge at the same time. Girls always say that, he said. They don't mean it. You know, that place, the Jolly Roger, wants a bit of livening up. Nothing jolly about it. No life in it. Of course there's a good amount of duds staying there. A lot of kids, to begin with and a lot of old fogies too. There's that old Anglo-Indian boar and that athletic parson and those yapping Americans and that foreigner with the mustache, makes me laugh that mustache of his. I should say he's a hairdresser, something of that sort. Christine shook her head. Oh no, he's a detective. Mr. Blatt nearly let the car go into the hedge again. A detective? Do you mean he's in disguise? Christine smiled faintly. She said. Oh no, he really is like that. He's Hercule Poirot. You must have heard of him. Mr. Blatt said. Didn't catch his name properly. Oh yes, I've heard of him. But I thought he was dead. Dash it, he ought to be dead. What's he after down here? He's not after anything, he's just on a holiday. Well, I suppose that might be so, Mr. Blatt seemed doubtful about it. Looks a bit of a bounder, doesn't he? Well, said Christine and hesitated. Perhaps a little peculiar. What I say is, said Mr. Blatt, what's wrong with Scotland Yard? By British every time for me. He reached the bottom of the hill and with a triumphant fanfare of the horn ran the car into the Jolly Rogers garage which was situated, for title reasons, on the mainland opposite the hotel. Linda Marshall was in the small shop which catered for the wants of visitors to Leathercombe Bay. One side of it was devoted to shelves on which were books which could be borrowed for the sum of tuppence. The newest of them was ten years old, some were twenty years old and others older still. Linda took first one and then another doubtfully from the shelf and glanced into it. She decided that she couldn't possibly read the four feathers or vice versa. She took out a small squat volume in brown calf. The time passed. With a start Linda shoved the book back in the shelf as Christine Redfern's voice said. What are you reading, Linda? Linda said hurriedly. Nothing. I'm looking for a book. She pulled out the marriage of William Ash at random and advanced to the counter fumbling for tuppence. Christine said. Mr. Blatt just drove me home, after nearly running over me first. I really felt I couldn't walk all across the causeway with him, so I said I had to buy some things. Linda said. He's awful, isn't he? Always saying how rich he is and making the most terrible jokes. Christine said. Poor man. One really feels rather sorry for him. Linda didn't agree. She didn't see anything to be sorry for in Mr. Blatt. She was young and ruthless. She walked with Christine Redfern out of the shop and down towards the causeway. She was busy with her own thoughts. She liked Christine Redfern. She and Rosamund Darnley were the only bearable people on the island in Linda's opinion. Neither of them talked much to her for one thing. Now, as they walked, Christine didn't say anything. That, Linda thought, was sensible. If you hadn't anything worth saying why go chattering all the time? She lost herself in her own perplexities. She said suddenly. Mrs. Redfern, have you ever felt that everything's so awful, so terrible, that you'll, oh, burst? The words were almost comic, but Linda's face, drawn and anxious, was not. Christine Redfern, looking at her at first vaguely, with scarcely comprehending eyes, certainly saw nothing to laugh at. She caught her breath sharply. She said, Yes, yes, I have felt, 
Just that. Mr. Blatt said. So you're the famous sleuth, eh? They were in the cocktail bar, a favorite haunt of Mr. Blatt's. Hercule Poirot acknowledged the remark with his usual lack of modesty. Mr. Blatt went on. And what are you doing down here, on a job? No, no. I repose myself. I take the holiday. Mr. Blatt winked. You'd say that anyway, wouldn't you? Poro replied. Not necessarily. Horace Blatt said. Oh. Come now. As a matter of fact you'd be safe enough with me. I don't repeat all I hear. Learned to keep my mouth shut years ago. Shouldn't have got on the way I have if I hadn't known how to do that. But you know what most people are, yap, yap, yap about everything they hear. Now you can't afford that in your trade. That's why you've got to keep it up that you're here holiday making and nothing else. Poro asked. And why should you suppose the contrary? Mr. Black closed one eye. He said. I'm a man of the world. I know the cut of a fellow's jib. A man like you would be at Deauville or Le Touquet or down at Juan Les Pins. That's your, what's the phrase, spiritual home. Poro sighed. He looked out of the window. Rain was falling and mist encircled the island. He said. It is possible that you are right. There, at least, in wet weather there are the distractions. Good old casino, said Mr. Blatt. You know. I've had to work pretty hard most of my life. No time for holidays or kickshaws. I meant to make good and I have made good. Now I can do what I please. My money's as good as any man's. I've seen a bit of life in the last few years, I can tell you." Poro murmured. Ah, yes? Don't know why I came to this place, Mr. Black continued. Poro observed. I, too wondered. Eh, what's that? Poro waved an eloquent hand. I, too, am not without observation. I should have expected you most certainly to choose Deauville or Biarritz. Instead of which, we're both here, eh? Mr. Blatt gave a hoarse chuckle. Don't really know why I came here, he mused. I think, you know, it sounded romantic. Jolly Roger Hotel, Smuggler's Island. That kind of address tickles you up, you know. Makes you think of when you were a boy. Pirates, smuggling, all that. He laughed, rather self-consciously. I used to sail quite a bit as a boy. Not this part of the world. Off the East Coast. Funny how a taste for that sort of thing never quite leaves you. I could have a tip-top yacht if I liked, but somehow I don't really fancy it. I like mucking about in that little yawl of mine. Redfern's keen on sailing, too. He's been out with me once or twice. Can't get hold of him now, always hanging round that red-haired wife of Marshall's. He paused, then lowering his voice, he went on. Mostly a dried-up lot of sticks in this hotel. Mrs. Marshall's about the only lively spot. I should think Marshall's got his hands full looking after her. All sorts of stories about her in her stage days, and after. Men go crazy about her. You'll see, there'll be a spot of trouble one of these days. Poro asked, what kind of trouble? Horace Blatt replied. That depends. I'd say, looking at Marshall, that he's a man with a funny kind of temper. As a matter of fact, I know he is. Heard something about him. I've met that quiet sort. Never know where you were with that kind. Redfern had better look out. He broke off, as the subject of his words came into the bar. He went on speaking loudly and self-consciously. And, as I say, sailing round this coast is good fun. Hello, Redfern, have one with me? What do you have? Dry martini? Right. What about you? M. Poro. Poro shook his head. Patrick Redfern sat down and said, Sailing? It's the best fun in the world. Wish I could do more of it. 
used to spend most of my time as a boy in a sailing dinghy round this coast. Poro said. Then you know this part of the world well? Rather. I knew this place before there was a hotel on it. There were just a few fishermen's cottages at Leathercombe Bay and a tumble-down old house, all shut up, on the island. There was a house here. Oh, yes, but it hadn't been lived in for years. Was practically falling down. There used to be all sorts of stories of secret passages from the house to Pixie's cave. We were always looking for that secret passage, I remember. Horace Blatt spilt his drink. He cursed, mopped himself and asked. What is this Pixie's cave? Patrick said. Oh, don't you know it? It's on Pixie Cove. You can't find the entrance to it easily. It's among a lot of piled up boulders at one end. Just a long thin crack. You can just squeeze through it. Inside it widens out into quite a big cave. You can imagine what fun it was to a boy. An old fisherman showed it to me. Nowadays, even the fishermen don't know about it. I asked one the other day why the place was called Pixie Cove and he couldn't tell me. Hercule Poro said. But I still do not understand. What is this Pixie? Patrick Redfern said. Oh. That's typically Devonshire. There's the Pixie's Cave at Sheepster on the moor. You're supposed to leave a pin, you know, as a present for the Pixie. A Pixie is a kind of moor spirit. Hercule Poro said. Ah. But it is interesting, that. Patrick Redfern went on. There's a lot of Pixie lore on Dartmoor still. There are tours that are said to Pixie ridden, and I expect that farmers coming home after a thick night still complain of being Pixie led. Horace Blatt said. You mean when they've had a couple? Patrick Redfern said with a smile. That's certainly the common sense explanation. Blatt looked at his watch. He said. I'm going into dinner. On the whole, Redfern, pirates are my favorites, not pixies. Patrick Redfern said with a laugh as the other went out. Faith, I'd like to see the old boy pixie let himself. Poro observed meditatively. For a hard-bitten businessman, M. Blatt seems to have a very romantic imagination. Patrick Redfern said. That's because he's only half-educated. Or so my wife says. Look at what he reads. Nothing but thrillers or Wild West stories. Poro said. You mean that he has still the mentality of a boy? Well, don't you think so, sir? Me, I have not seen very much of him. I haven't either. I've been out sailing with him once or twice, but he doesn't really like having anyone with him. He prefers to be on his own. Hercule Poro said. That is indeed curious. It is singularly unlike his practice on land. Redfern laughed. He said. I know. We all have a bit of trouble keeping out of his way. He'd like to turn this place into a cross between Margate and Latuquit. Poro said nothing for a minute or two. He was studying the laughing face of his companion very attentively. He said suddenly and unexpectedly. I think, M. Redfern, that you enjoy living. Patrick stared at him, surprised. Indeed I do. Why not? Why not indeed, agreed Poro. I make you my felicitation on the fact. Smiling a little, Patrick Redfern said. Thank you, sir. That is why, as an older man, a very much older man, I venture to offer you a piece of advice. Yes, sir. A very wise friend of mine in the police force said to me years ago, Hercule, my friend, if you would know tranquility, avoid women. Patrick Redfern said. I'm afraid it's a bit late for that, sir. I'm married, you know. I do know. Your wife is a very charming, a very accomplished woman. She is, I think, very fond of you. Patrick Redfern said sharply. I'm very fond of her. And N. BSP, ah, said Hercule Poirot, 
I am delighted to hear it. Patrick's brow was suddenly like thunder. Look here, M. Poro, what are you getting at? Less femmes. Poro leaned back and closed his eyes. I know something of them. They are capable of complicating life unbearably. In the English, they conduct their affairs indescribably. If it was necessary for you to come here, M. Redfern, why, in the name of heaven, did you bring your wife? Patrick Redfern said angrily. I don't know what you mean. Hercule Poirot said calmly. You know perfectly. I am not so foolish as to argue with an infatuated man. I utter only the word of caution. You've been listening to these damned scandalmongers. Mrs. Gardner, the Brewster woman, nothing to do but to clack their tongues all day. Just because a woman's good-looking, they're down on her like a sack of coals. Hercule Poirot got up. He murmured. Are you really as young as all that? Shaking his head, he left the bar. Patrick Redfern stared angrily after him. Hercule Poirot paused in the hall on his way from the dining room. The doors were open, a breath of soft night air came in. The rain had stopped and the mist had dispersed. It was a fine night again. Hercule Poirot found Mrs. Redfern in her favorite seat on the cliff ledge. He stopped by her and said, This seat is damp. You should not sit here. You will catch the chill. No, I shan't. And what does it matter anyway? Ska, Ska, you are not a child. You are an educated woman. You must look at things sensibly. She said coldly. I can assure you I never take cold. Poro said. It has been a wet day. The wind blew, the rain came down, and the mist was everywhere so that one could not see through it. Eh bien, what is it like now? The mists have rolled away, the sky is clear and up above the stars shine. That is like life, madam. Christine said in a low fierce voice. Do you know what I am most sick of in this place? What, madam? Pity. She brought the word out like the flick of a whip. She went on. Do you think I don't know? That I can't see. All the time people are saying, poor Mrs. Redfern, that poor little woman. And anyway, I'm not little, I'm tall. They say little because they are sorry for me. And I can't bear it. Cautiously, Hercule Poirot spread his handkerchief on the seat and sat down. He said thoughtfully, there is something in that. That woman, said Christine and stopped. Poirot said gravely. Will you allow me to tell you something, madam? Something that is as true as the stars above us? The Arlena Stewarts, or Arlena Marshalls, of this world, do not count. Christine Redfern said. Nonsense. I assure you, it is true. Their empire is of the moment and for the moment. To count, really and truly to count, a woman must have goodness or brains. Christine said scornfully. Do you think men care for goodness or brains? Poirot said gravely. Fundamentally, yes. Christine laughed shortly. I don't agree with you. Poirot said. Your husband loves you, madam. I know it. You can't know it. Yes, yes. I know it. I have seen him looking at you. Suddenly she broke down. She wept stormily and bitterly against Poro's accommodating shoulder. She said, I can't bear it. I can't bear it. Poro patted her arm. He said soothingly, Patience, only patience. She sat up and pressed her handkerchief to her eyes. She said in a stifled voice, it's all right. I'm better now. Leave me. I'd, I'd rather be alone. He obeyed and left her sitting there while he himself followed the winding path down to the hotel. He was nearly there when he heard the murmur of voices. He turned a little aside from the path. There was a gap in the bushes. He saw Arlena Marshall and Patrick Redfern beside her. 
he heard the man's voice, with the throb in it of emotion. I'm crazy about you, crazy, you've driven me mad. You do care a little, you do care? He saw Arlena Marshall's face, it was, he thought, like a sleek happy cat, it was animal, not human. She said softly. Of course, Patrick darling, I adore you. You know that. For once Hercule Poirot cut his eavesdropping short. He went back to the path and on down to the hotel. A figure joined him suddenly. It was Captain Marshall. Marshall said. Remarkable night, what? After that foul day. He looked up at the sky. Looks as though we should have fine weather tomorrow. 4. The morning of the 25th of August dawned bright and cloudless. It was a morning to tempt even an inveterate sluggard to rise early. Several people rose early that morning at the Jolly Roger. It was 8 o'clock when Linda, sitting at her dressing table, turned a little thick calf-bound volume face downwards, sprawling it open and looked at her own face in the mirror. Her lips were set tight together and the pupils of her eyes contracted. She said below her breath. I'll do it. She slipped out of her pajamas and into her bathing dress. Over it she flung on a bathrobe and laced espadrilles on her feet. She went out of her room and along the passage. At the end of it a door onto the balcony led to an outside staircase leading directly down to the rocks below the hotel. There was a small iron ladder clamped onto the rocks leading down into the water which was used by many of the hotel guests for a before breakfast dip as taking up less time than going down to the main bathing beach. As Linda started down from the balcony she met her father coming up. He said. You're up early. Going to have a dip? Linda nodded. They passed each other. Instead of going on down the rocks, however, Linda skirted round the hotel to the left until she came to the path down to the causeway connecting the hotel with the mainland. The tide was high and the causeway underwater, but the boat that took hotel guests across was tied to a little jetty. The man in charge of it was absent at the moment. Linda got in, untied it and rowed herself across. She tied up the boat on the other side, walked up the slope, past the hotel garage and along until she reached the general shop. The woman had just taken down the shutters and was engaged in sweeping out the floor. She looked amazed at the sight of Linda. Well, miss, you are up early. Linda put her hand in the pocket of her bath wrap and brought out some money. She proceeded to make her purchases. Christine Redfern was standing in Linda's room when the girl returned. Oh, there you are. Christine exclaimed. I thought you couldn't be really up yet. Linda said. No, I've been bathing. Noticing the parcel in her hand, Christine said with surprise. The post has come early today. Linda flushed. With her habitual nervous clumsiness the parcel slipped from her hand. The flimsy string broke and some of the contents rolled over the floor. Christine exclaimed. What have you been buying candles for? But to Linda's relief she did not wait for an answer, but went on, as she helped to pick the things up from the floor. I came in to ask whether you would like to come with me to Gull Cove this morning. I want a sketch there. Linda accepted with alacrity. In the last few days she had accompanied Christine Redfern more than once on sketching expeditions. Christine was a most indifferent artist but it is possible that she found the excuse of painting a help to her pride since her husband now spent most of his time with Arlena Marshall. Linda Marshall had been increasingly morose and bad-tempered. She liked being with Christine who, intent on her work, spoke very little. It was, Linda felt, nearly as good as being by oneself, and in a curious way she craved for company of some kind. There was a subtle kind of sympathy between her and the elder woman, probably based on the fact of their mutual dislike of the same person. Christine said. I'm playing tennis at 12, so we'd better start fairly early. Half past 10? Right. I'll be ready. Meet you in the hall. Rosamund Darnley, strolling out of the dining room after a very late breakfast, was canonied into by Linda as the latter came tearing down the stairs. 
Oh. Sorry, Miss Darnley. Rosamund said, lovely morning, isn't it? One can hardly believe it after yesterday. I know. I'm going with Mrs. Redfern to Gull Cove. I said I'd meet her at half past ten. I thought I was late. No, it's only twenty-five past. Oh. Good. She was panting a little and Rosamund looked at her curiously. You're not feverish, are you, Linda? The girl's eyes were very bright and she had a vivid patch of color in each cheek. Oh. No. I'm never feverish. Rosamund smiled and said. It's such a lovely day I got up for breakfast. Usually I have it in bed. But today I came down and faced eggs and bacon like a man. I know, it's heavenly after yesterday. Gull Cove is nice in the morning. I shall put a lot of oil on and get really brown. Rosamund said. Yes, Gull Cove is nice in the morning. And it's more peaceful than the beach here. Linda said, rather shyly. Come too. Rosamund shook her head. She said. Not this morning. I've other fish to fry. Christine Redfern came down the stairs. She was wearing beach pajamas of a loose floppy pattern with long sleeves and wide legs. They were made of some green material with a yellow design. Rosamund's tongue itched to tell her that yellow and green were the most unbecoming colors possible for her fair, slightly anemic complexion. It always annoyed Rosamund when people had no clothes sense. She thought, if I dressed that girl, I'd soon make her husband sit up and take notice. However much of a fool Arlena is, she does know how to dress. This wretched girl looks just like a wilting lettuce. Aloud she said. Have a nice time. I'm going to Sunny Ledge with a book. Hercule Poro breakfasted in his room as usual off coffee and rolls. The beauty of the morning, however, tempted him to leave the hotel earlier than usual. It was ten o'clock, at least half an hour before his usual appearance, when he descended to the bathing beach. The beach itself was empty save for one person. That person was Arlena Marshall. Clad in her white bathing dress, the green Chinese hat on her head, she was trying to launch a white wooden float. Poro came gallantly to the rescue, completely immersing a pair of white suede shoes in doing so. She thanked him with one of those sideways glances of hers. Just as she was pushing off, she called him. M. Poro? Poro leaped to the water's edge. Madam. Arlena Marshall said. Do something for me, will you? Anything. She smiled at him. She murmured. Don't tell anyone where I am. She made her glance appealing. Everyone will follow me about so. I just want for once to be alone. She paddled off vigorously. Poro walked up the beach. He murmured to himself. Ah, c'est, si, jamais. That, par exemple, I do not believe. He doubted if Arlena Stewart, to give her her stage name, had ever wanted to be alone in her life. Hercule Poirot, that man of the world, knew better. Arlena Marshall was doubtless keeping a rendezvous, and Poirot had a very good idea with whom. Or thought he had, but there he found himself proved wrong. For just as she floated round at the point of the bay and disappeared out of sight, Patrick Redfern closely followed by Kenneth Marshall, came striding down the beach from the hotel. Marshall nodded to Poirot, Morning, Poirot. See my wife anywhere about? Poirot's answer was diplomatic. Has Madame then risen so early? Marshall said. She's not in her room. He looked up at the sky. Lovely day. I shall have a bathe right away. Got a lot of typing to do this morning. Patrick Redfern, less openly, was looking up and down the beach. He sat down near Poirot and prepared to wait for the arrival of his lady. Poirot said. And Madame Redfern? Has she too risen early? Patrick Redfern said. Christine? Oh, she's going off sketching. 
she's rather keen on art just now. He spoke impatiently, his mind clearly elsewhere. As time passed he displayed his impatience for Arlena's arrival only too crudely. At every footstep he turned an eager head to see who it was coming down from the hotel. Disappointment followed disappointment. First Mr. and Mrs. Gardner complete with knitting and book and then Miss Brewster arrived. Mrs. Gardner, industrious as ever, settled herself in her chair and began to knit vigorously and talk at the same time. Well, M. Poirot. The beach seems very deserted this morning. Where is everybody? Poirot replied that the Mastermans and the Cowans, two families with young people in them, had gone off on an all-day sailing excursion. Why that certainly does make all the difference, not having them about laughing and calling out. And only one person bathing, Captain Marshall. Marshall had just finished his swim. He came up the beach swinging his towel. Pretty good in the sea this morning, he said. Unfortunately I've got a lot of work to do. Must go and get on with it. Why, if that isn't too bad, Captain Marshall. On a beautiful day like this, too. My, wasn't yesterday too terrible? I said to Mr. Gardner that if the weather was going to continue like that we'd just have to leave. It's the melancholy, you know, with the mist right up around the island. Gives you a kind of ghostly feeling, but then I've always been very susceptible to atmosphere ever since I was a child. Sometimes, you know, I'd feel I just had to scream and scream. And that, of course, was very trying to my parents. But my mother was a lovely woman and she said to my father, Sinclair, if the child feels like that, we must let her do it. Screaming is her way of expressing herself. And of course, my father agreed. He was devoted to my mother and just did everything she said. They were a perfectly lovely couple, as I'm sure Mr. Gardner will agree. They were a very remarkable couple, weren't they, Odell? Yes, darling, said Mr. Gardner. And where's your girl this morning, Captain Marshall? Linda? I don't know. I expect she's mooning round the island somewhere. You know, Captain Marshall, that girl looks kind of peaky to me. She needs feeding up and very very sympathetic treatment. Kenneth Marshall said curtly. Linda's all right. He went up to the hotel. Patrick Redfern did not go into the water. He sat about, frankly looking up towards the hotel. He was beginning to look a shade sulky. Miss Brewster was brisk and cheerful when she arrived. The conversation was much as it had been on a previous morning. Gentle yapping from Mrs. Gardner and short staccato barks from Miss Brewster. She remarked at last, beach seems a bit empty. Everyone off on excursions? Mrs. Gardner said. I was saying to Mr. Gardner only this morning that we simply must make an excursion to Dartmoor. It's quite near and the associations are all so romantic. And I'd like to see that convict prison, Princetown, isn't it? I think we'd better fix up right away and go there tomorrow, Odell. Mr. Gardner said. Yes, darling. Hercule Poirot said to Miss Brewster. You are going to bathe, mademoiselle? Oh, I've had my morning dip before breakfast. Somebody nearly brained me with a bottle, too chucked it out of one of the hotel windows. Now that's a very dangerous thing to do, said Mrs. Gardner. I had a very dear friend who got concussion by a toothpaste tin falling on him in the street, thrown out of a 35th story window it was. A most dangerous thing to do. He got very substantial damages. She began to hunt among her skeins of wool. Why, Odell, I don't believe I've got that second shade of purple wool. It's in the second drawer of the bureau in our bedroom or it might be the third. Yes, darling. Mr. Gardner rose obediently and departed on his search. Mrs. Gardner went on. Sometimes, you know, I do think that maybe we're going a little too far nowadays. What with all our great discoveries and all the electrical waves there must be in the atmosphere, I do think it leads to a great deal of mental unrest and I just feel that maybe the time has come for a new message to humanity. 
I don't know, M. Poirot, if you've ever interested yourself in the prophecies from the pyramids. I have not, said Poirot. Well, I do assure you that they're very, very interesting. What with Moscow being exactly a thousand miles due north of, now what was it, would it be Nineveh, but anyway you take a circle and it just shows the most surprising things, and one can just see that there must have been special guidance, and that those ancient Egyptians couldn't have thought of what they did all by themselves. NWH And you've gone into the theory of the numbers and their repetition, why it's all just so clear that I can't see how anyone can doubt the truth of it for a moment. Mrs. Gardner paused triumphantly but neither Poirot nor Miss Emily Brewster felt moved to argue the point. Poirot studied his white suede shoes ruefully. Emily Brewster said. You been paddling with your shoes on, M. Poirot? Poirot murmured. Alas. I was precipitate. Emily Brewster lowered her voice. She said. Where's our vamp this morning? She's late. Mrs. Gardner, raising her eyes from her knitting to study Patrick Redfern, murmured. He looks just like a thundercloud. Oh dear, I do feel the whole thing is such a pity. I wonder what Captain Marshall thinks about it all. He's such a nice quiet man, very British and unassuming. You just never know what he's thinking about things. Patrick Redfern rose and began to pace up and down the beach. Mrs. Gardner murmured. Just like a tiger. Three pairs of eyes watched his pacing. Their scrutiny seemed to make Patrick Redfern uncomfortable. He looked more than sulky now. He looked in a flaming temper. In the stillness a faint chime from the mainland came to their ears. Emily Brewster murmured. Winds from the east again. That's a good sign when you can hear the church clock strike. Nobody said any more until Mr. Gardner returned with a skein of brilliant magenta wool. Why, Odell, what a long time you have been. Sorry darling, but you see it wasn't in your bureau at all. I found it on your wardrobe shelf. Why, isn't that too extraordinary? I could have declared I put it in that bureau drawer. I do think it's fortunate that I've never had to give evidence in a court case. I'd just worry myself to death in case I wasn't remembering a thing just right. Mr. Gardner said. Mrs. Gardner is very conscientious. It was some five minutes later that Patrick Redfern said. Going for your row this morning, Miss Brewster? Mind if I come with you? Miss Brewster said heartily. Delighted. Let's row right round the island, proposed Redfern. Miss Brewster consulted her watch. Shall we have time? Oh yes, it's not half past eleven yet. Come on, then, let's start. They went down the beach together. Patrick Redfern took first turn at the oars. He rowed with a powerful stroke. The boat leapt forward. Emily Brewster said approvingly. Good. We'll see if you can keep that up. He laughed into her eyes. His spirits had improved. I shall probably have a fine crop of blisters by the time we get back. He threw up his head, tossing back his black hair. God, it's a marvelous day. If you do get a real summer's day in England there's nothing to beat it. Emily Brewster said gruffly. Can't beat England anyway in my opinion. Only place in the world to live in. I'm with you. They rounded the point of the bay to the west and rode under the cliffs. Patrick Redfern looked up. Anyone on Sunny Ledge this morning? Yes, there's a sunshade. Who is it, I wonder? Emily Brewster said. It's Miss Darnley, I think. She's got one of those Japanese affairs. They rode up the coast. On their left was the open sea. Emily Brewster said. We ought to have gone the other way round. This way we've got the current against us. There's very little current. I've swum out here and not noticed it. Anyway we couldn't go the other way, the causeway wouldn't be covered. Depends on the tide, of course. But they always say that bathing from Pixie Cove is dangerous if you swim out too far. Patrick was rowing vigorously still. 
At the same time he was scanning the cliffs attentively. Emily Brewster thought suddenly. He's looking for the martial woman. That's why he wanted to come with me. She hasn't shown up this morning and he's wondering what she's up to. Probably she's done it on purpose. Just to move in the game, to make him keener. They rounded the jutting point of rock to the south of the little bay named Pixie's Cove. It was quite a small cove, with rocks dotted fantastically about the beach. It faced nearly northwest and the cliff overhung it a good deal. It was a favorite place for picnic teas. In the morning, when the sun was off, it was not popular and there was seldom anyone there. On this occasion, however, there was a figure on the beach. Patrick Redfern's stroke checked and recovered. He said in a would-be casual tone. Hello, who's that? Miss Brewster said dryly. It looks like Mrs. Marshall. Patrick Redfern said, as though struck by the idea. So it does. He altered his course, rolling inshore. Emily Brewster protested. We don't want to land here, do we? Patrick Redfern said quickly. Oh, plenty of time. His eyes looked into hers, something in them, a naive pleading look rather like that of an importunate dog, silenced Emily Brewster. She thought to herself. Poor boy, he's got it badly. Oh well, it can't be helped. He'll get over it in time. The boat was fast approaching the beach. Arlena Marshall was lying face downwards on the shingle, her arms outstretched. The white float was drawn up nearby. Something was puzzling Emily Brewster. It was as though she was looking at something she knew quite well but which was in one respect quite wrong. It was a minute or two before it came to her. Arlena Marshall's attitude was the attitude of a sunbather. So had she lain many a time on the beach by the hotel, her bronzed body outstretched and the green cardboard hat protecting her head and neck. But there was no sun on Pixie's beach and there would be none for some hours yet. The overhanging cliff protected the beach from the sun in the morning. A vague feeling of apprehension came over Emily Brewster. The boat grounded on the shingle. Patrick Redfern called. Hello, Arlena. And then Emily Brewster's foreboding took definite shape. For the recumbent figure did not move or answer. Emily saw Patrick Redfern's face change. He jumped out of the boat and she followed him. They dragged the boat ashore then set off up the beach to where that white figure lay so still and unresponsive near the bottom of the cliff. Patrick Redfern got there first but Emily Brewster was close behind him. She saw as one sees in a dream, the bronzed limbs, the white backless bathing dress, the red curl of hair escaping under the jade green hat, saw something else too, the curious unnatural angle of the outspread arms. Felt, in that minute, that this body had not lain down but had been thrown. She heard Patrick's voice, a mere frightened whisper. He knelt down beside that still form, touched the hand, the arm. He said in a low shuddering whisper, my God, she's dead. And then, as he lifted the hat a little, peered at the neck. Oh, God, she's been strangled, murdered. It was one of those moments when time stands still. With an odd feeling of unreality Emily Brewster heard herself saying. We must touch anything. Not until the police come. Redfern's answer came mechanically. No, no, of course not. And then, in a deep agonized whisper. Who? Who? Who could have done that to Arlena? She can't have, have been murdered. It can't be true. Emily Brewster shook her head, not knowing quite what to answer. She heard him draw in his breath, heard the low controlled rage in his voice as he said. My God, if I get my hands on the foul fiend who did this. Emily Brewster shivered. Her imagination pictured a lurking murderer behind one of the boulders. Then she heard her voice saying. Whoever did it wouldn't be hanging about. We must get the police. Perhaps, she hesitated, one of us ought to stay with, with the body. Patrick Redfern said. I'll stay. 
Emily Brewster drew a little sigh of relief. She was not the kind of woman who would ever admit to feeling fear, but she was secretly thankful not to have to remain on that beach alone with the faint possibility of a homicidal maniac lingering close at hand. She said. Good. I'll be as quick as I can. I'll go in the boat. Can't face that ladder. There's a constable at Leathercombe Bay. Patrick Redfern murmured mechanically. Yes, yes, whatever you think best. As she rowed vigorously away from the shore, Emily Brewster saw Patrick drop down beside the dead woman and bury his head in his hands. There was something so forlorn about his attitude that she felt an unwilling sympathy. He looked like a dog watching by its dead master. Nevertheless her robust common sense was saying to her. Best thing that could have happened for him and his wife, and for Marshall and the child, but I don't suppose he can see it that way, poor devil. Emily Brewster was a woman who could always rise to an emergency. 5. Inspector Colgate stood back by the cliff waiting for the police surgeon to finish with Arlena's body. Patrick Redfern and Emily Brewster stood a little to one side. Dr. Neeson rose from his knees with a quick deft movement. He said, Strangled, and by a pretty powerful pair of hands. She doesn't seem to have put up much of a struggle. Taken by surprise. Hum, well, nasty business. Emily Brewster had taken one look and then quickly averted her eyes from the dead woman's face. That horrib. Low purple convulsed countenance. Inspector Colgate asked. What about time of death? Neeson said irritably. Can't say definitely without knowing more about her. Lots of factors to take into account. Let's see, it's quarter to one now. What time was it when you found her? Patrick Redfern, to whom the question was addressed, said vaguely. Sometime before twelve. I don't know exactly. Emily Brewster said. It was exactly a quarter to twelve when we found she was dead. Ah, and you came here in the boat. What time was it when you caught sight of her lying here? Emily Brewster considered. I should say we rounded the point about five or six minutes earlier. She turned to Redfern. Do you agree? He said vaguely. Yes, yes, about that, I should think. Neeson asked the inspector in a low voice. This the husband? Oh. I see, my mistake. Thought it might be. He seems rather done and over it. He raised his voice officially. Let's put it at twenty minutes to twelve. She cannot have been killed very long before that. Say between then and eleven, quarter to eleven at the earliest outside limit. The inspector shut his notebook with a snap. Thanks, he said. That ought to help us considerably. Puts it within very narrow limits, less than an hour all told. He turned to Miss Brewster. Now then, I think it's all clear so far. You're Miss Emily Brewster and this is Mr. Patrick Redfern, both staying at the Jolly Roger Hotel. You identify this lady as a fellow guest of yours at the hotel, the wife of a Captain Marshall? Emily Brewster nodded. Then, I think, said Inspector Colgate, that we'll adjourn to the hotel. He beckoned to a constable. Hawks, you stay here and don't allow anyone onto this cove. I'll be sending Phillips along later. Upon my soul, said Colonel Weston. This is a surprise finding you here. Hercule Poirot replied to the chief constable's greeting in a suitable manner. He murmured. Ah, yes, many years have passed since that affair at St. Lou. I haven't forgotten it, though, said Weston. Biggest surprise of my life. The thing I've never got over, though, is the way you got round me about that funeral business. Absolutely unorthodox, the whole thing. Fantastic. Tout de meme, mon colonel, said Poirot. It produced the goods, did it not? Air, well, possibly. I dare say we should have got there by more orthodox methods. It is possible, agreed Poirot diplomatically. And here you are in the thick of another murder, said the chief constable. 
Any ideas about this one? Poro said slowly. Nothing definite, but it is interesting. Going to give us a hand? You would permit it, yes? My dear fellow, delighted to have you. Don't know enough yet to decide whether it's a case for Scotland Yard or not. Offhand it looks as though our murderer must be pretty well within a limited radius. On the other hand, all these people are strangers down here. To find out about them and their motives you've got to go to London. Poro said. Yes, that is true. First of all, said Weston, we've got to find out who last saw the dead woman alive. Chambermaid took her her breakfast at nine. Girl in the bureau downstairs saw her pass through the lounge and go out about ten. My friend, said Poro, I suspect that I am the man you want. You saw her this morning? What time? At five minutes past ten. I assisted her to launch her float from the bathing beach. And she went off on it. Yes. Alone? Yes. Did you see which direction she took? She paddled round that point there to the right. In the direction of Pixie's Cove, that is. Yes. And the time then was? I should say she actually left the beach at a quarter past ten. Weston considered. That fits in well enough. How long should you say that it would take her to paddle round to the cove? Ah me, I am not an expert. I do not go in boats or expose myself on floats. Perhaps half an hour? That's about what I think, said the colonel. She wouldn't be hurrying, I presume. Well, if she arrived there at a quarter to eleven, that fits in well enough. At what time does your doctor suggest she died? Oh, Neeston doesn't commit himself. He's a cautious chap. A quarter to eleven is his earliest outside limit. Poro nodded. He said, There's one other point that I must mention. As she left, Mrs. Marshall asked me not to say I had seen her. Weston stared. He said, Hum, that's rather suggestive, isn't it? Poro murmured. Yes. I thought so myself. Weston tugged at his mustache. He said, Look here, Poro. You're a man of the world. What sort of a woman was Mrs. Marshall? A faint smile came to Poro's lips. He asked, Have you not already heard? The chief constable said dryly, I know what the women say of her. They would. How much truth is there in it? Was she having an affair with this fellow Redfern? I should say undoubtedly yes. He followed her down here, eh? There's reason to suppose so. And the husband? Did he know about it? What did he feel? Poro said slowly. It is not easy to know what Captain Marshall feels or thinks. He is a man who does not display his emotions. Weston said sharply. But he might have them, all the same. Poro nodded. He said. Oh yes, he might have them. Three. The chief constable was being as tactful as it was in his nature to be with Mrs. Castle. Mrs. Castle was the owner and proprietress of the Jolly Roger Hotel. She was a woman of forty-odd with a large bust, rather violent henna red hair, and an almost offensively refined manner of speech. She was saying. That such a thing should happen in my hotel. I am sure it has always been the quietest place imaginable. The people who come here are such nice people. No rowdiness, if you know what I mean. Not like the big hotels in St. Lou. Quite so, Mrs. Castle, said Colonel Weston. But accidents happen in the best regulated, or households. I am sure Inspector Colgate will bear me out, said Mrs. Castle, sending an appealing glance towards the inspector who was sitting looking very official. As to the licensing laws, I am most particular. There has never been any irregularity. Quite, quite, said Weston. We're not blaming you in any way, Mrs. Castle. But it does so reflect upon an establishment, said Mrs. Castle, her large bust heaving. When I think of the noisy gaping crowds. 
Of course no one but hotel guests are allowed upon the island, but all the same they will no doubt come and point from the shore. She shuddered. Inspector Colgate saw his chance to turn the conversation to good account. He said. In regard to that point you've just raised. Access to the island. How do you keep people off? I am most. Particular about it. Yes, but what measures do you take? What keeps them off? Holiday crowds in summertime swarm everywhere like flies. Mrs. Castle shrugged slightly again. She said. That is the fault of the share banks. I have seen 18 at one time parked by the quay at Leathercombe Bay. 18. Just so. How do you stop them coming here? There are notices. And then, of course, at high tide, we are cut off. Yes, but at low tide? Mrs. Castle explained. At the island end of the causeway there was a gate. This said Jolly Roger Hotel. Private. No entry except to hotel. The rocks rose sheer out of the sea on either side there and could not be climbed. Anyone could take a boat, though, I suppose, and row round and land on one of the coves? You couldn't stop them doing that. There's a right of access to the foreshore. You can't stop people being on the beach between low and high watermark. But this, it seemed, very seldom happened. Boats could be obtained at Leathercombe Bay Harbor, but from there it was a long row to the island, and there was also a strong current just outside Leathercombe Bay Harbor. There were notices, too, on both Gull Cove and Pixie Cove by the latter. She added that George or William were always on the lookout at the bathing beach proper which was the nearest to the mainland. Who are George and William? George attends to the bathing beach. He sees to the costumes and the floats. William is the gardener. He keeps the paths and marks the tennis courts and all that. Colonel Weston said impatiently. Well, that seems clear enough. That's not to say that nobody could have come from outside, but anyone who did so took a risk, the risk of being noticed. We'll have a word with George and William presently. Mrs. Castle said. I do not care for trippers, a very noisy crowd, and they frequently leave orange peel and cigarette boxes on the causeway and down by the rocks, but all the same I never thought one of them would turn out to be a murderer. Oh dear! It really is too terrible for words. A lady like Mrs. Marshall murdered in what's so horrible, actually, er, strangled. Mrs. Castle could hardly bring herself to say the word. She brought it out with the utmost reluctance. Inspector Colgate said soothingly. Yes, it's a nasty business. And the newspapers. My hotel and the newspapers. Colgate said, with a faint grin. Oh well, it's advertisement, in a way. Mrs. Castle drew herself up. Her bust heaved and whalebone creaked. She said icily. That is not the kind of advertisement I care about, Mr. Colgate. Colonel Weston broke in. He said. Now then, Mrs. Castle, you've got a list of the guests staying here, as I asked you. Yes, sir. Colonel Weston poured over the hotel register. He looked over to Poirot who made the fourth member of the group assembled in the manager's office. This is where you'll probably be able to help us presently. He read down the names. What about servants? Mrs. Castle produced a second list. There are four chambermaids, the head waiter and three under him and Henry in the bar. William does the boots and shoes. Then there's the cook and two under her. What about the waiters? Well, Sir, Albert, the modern hotel, came to me from the Vincent at Plymouth. He was there for some years. The three under him have been here for three years, one of them four. They are very nice lads and most respectable. Henry has been here since the hotel opened. He is quite an institution. Weston nodded. He said to Colgate. Seems all right. You'll check up on them, of course. Thank you, Mrs. Castle. That will be all you require. For the moment, 
Yes. Mrs. Castle creaked out of the room. Weston said. First thing to do is to talk with Captain Marshall. Kenneth Marshall sat quietly answering the questions put to him. Apart from a slight hardening of his features he was quite calm. Seen here, with the sunlight falling on him from the window, you realized that he was a handsome man. Those straight features, the steady blue eyes, the firm mouth. His voice was low and pleasant. Colonel Weston was saying. I quite understand, Captain Marshall, what a terrible shock this must be to you. But you realize that I am anxious to get the fullest information as soon as possible. Marshall nodded. He said. I quite understand. Carry on. Mrs. Marshall was your second wife? Yes. And you have been married how long? Just over four years. And her name before she was married? Helen Stewart. Her acting name was Arlena Stewart. She was an actress. She appeared in review and musical shows. Did she give up the stage on her marriage? No. She continued to appear. She actually retired only about a year and a half ago. Was there any special reason for her retirement? Kenneth Marshall appeared to consider. No, he said. She simply said that she was tired of it all. It was not, er, in obedience to your special wish? Marshall raised his eyebrows. Oh, no. You were quite content for her to continue acting after your marriage? Marshall smiled very faintly.